All right, let's get started. Okay, so welcome everybody to the ACR uh, Resident Fellow Section AI Subcommittee Journal Club, the March edition. Uh, my name is Sina Mazahari. I'm one of the uh, radiology residents, uh, second year radiology resident at Emory. And I am extremely excited and honored to be moderating this journal club today. Um, so today we'll be discussing multimodal fusion uh, with deep neural networks for leveraging CT imaging and electronic health record which, with a pretty impressive uh, panel, which I'll be introducing to you in a minute. Uh, so before we start, there we go. Uh, quickly going over the agenda for today, uh, I'll be over the first 20 minutes or so after introductions, I will be giving um, an overview of the article. Uh, and for the remainder of the hour, we'll have a discussion with our panelists and uh, Q&A from you guys. Any questions that you have, you can ask uh, either through the Q&A feature, which we prefer, or the chat function. And also, I just wanted to mention that you can uh, access the recordings from previous sessions and this session uh, on the address we see here um, on acr.org. And also, you can find our posts on the Rad AI Journal Club uh, with this hashtag over here on Twitter. Okay, uh, and before I get started, this is the uh, uh, roster for advisory council for this year. Uh, uh, this is me right here, if you don't see my video uh, feed. And uh, you hopefully meet the other wonderful people on this panel throughout the year through the remainder of the year. Um, all right. Our panelists uh, really don't need any introduction to people who've been following this space for the past few years, but I'll do my best. Um, first, we have Mars Wong. Mars is a PhD candidate at Stanford Center for Artificial Intelligence in Medicine and Imaging. Uh, Dr. Iman Banerjee is currently a lead AI scientist at Mayo Clinic and was previously at Emory and before that at Stanford. Uh, Dr. Matthew Longren, um, he's the principal for clinical AI and machine learning at Amazon Web Services uh, and worldwide public sector healthcare. And before that, he was an interventional radiologist at Stanford. And Dr. Judy Petroya, uh, one of my dear mentors, uh, he's currently, uh, she's currently an interventional radiologist at Emory and also a data scholar at the Fogarty International Center at the NIH. Um, so pretty exciting panel. Um, so the article we're discussing today um, is labeled uh, multimodal fusion with deep neural networks for leveraging CT imaging and electronic health records, a case study in pulmonary embolism detection. This article was published uh, in Nature Scientific Reports in 2020. Uh, before we jump in, uh, I wanted to give a quick background of what we're discussing, uh, namely multimodal fusion. So what is multimodal fusion? What are we talking about? This is basically referring uh, to a process of joining data from multiple modalities. And by modality, what I mean is different sources of data. For example, uh, imaging data, it could be a photograph of a skin lesion, uh, retina, uh, or it could be EMR data like vitals, like your medic uh, medications, radiology reports, all the above. We're trying to combine all these different modalities to hopefully get a better, more complementary picture um, of what we're trying to do with, uh, with our uh, model. And you may ask, um, what you know? How long has it been around? Is it new? Well, not quite. It's been around for quite some time. And I guess the best example of this would be uh, looking at self-driving cars. Um, these cars basically have a lot of different sorts of data coming into uh, their system. They have cameras, they have lidar sensors, they have GPS data coming in, and the machine learning model, which is pretty sophisticated, grabs all of this data and allows the car to uh, basically get a good understanding of its surrounding per se. In the medical field, uh, this has been gaining more traction over the past few years. And I will uh, refer you to a pretty great systematic review again by authors who are on this panel tonight, which kind of goes over some of these studies, but they've also been shown uh, to be pretty good in detecting Alzheimer's disease, breast cancer, and skin cancer for just a few uh, use cases. Uh, the other question is why should we consider even um, playing around and using uh, fusion models? Why not just stick to our single modality? Um, well, the explanation there is that, you know, in real life, in real clinical practice, um, different uh, specialties, any single specialty you can think of, really takes information from different 
um, you know, sources like physical exam, or, you know, past medical history, imaging, lab data, all that stuff. They take it together uh, to clinicians and come up with a differential diagnosis, treatment. So if you're trying to apply these machine learning models to our clinical practice, it makes sense to try to mimic uh, the real world um, scenario. And also, again, uh, referring that systematic review again, you see that these models actually do perform uh, uh, kind of better than the single modality uh, counterparts. Uh, going into the types of uh, fusion, um, again, referring to the systematic review paper, uh, they provide a um, kind of categorization uh, which uh, involves early fusion, joint fusion, and late fusion. I'm gonna quickly kind of go over these. In early fusion, what's happening is from early on at the feature level, you're combining these features or you know, raw data or their um, representation or extracted features to create this combined cohort. And then you're feeding that into your model and you're arriving at the prediction. In joint fusion, what is happening is um, instead you're feeding your raw data, first of all, into a neural network. And that neural network will go through the data, learn the data, look at the stuff, and will spit out a uh, learned representation of that raw data. And then that will become uh, the combined input that you're putting into your fusion. The benefit of this model, uh, this architecture, is that the loss, which um, basically is the difference between what your machine uh, learning model is pre uh, uh, predicting and what you wanted to predict, basically the ground truth, you're trying to minimize that loss. And that's how the machine learning model learns. But basically you're trying to minimize that loss. And in this structure, that loss gets propagated all the way back, not only through your own model, but also through the initial neural network that's doing the, um, the representation uh, kind of extraction. So you can argue that this architecture allows even those initial models to learn and get better at what they're doing. And you can do it either on just one modality of your data or you do it on uh, you know, both. And lastly, the late fusion or the decision level fusion, um, it's kind of straightforward. You have your single modality models. They do their own thing. They uh, come up with their prediction and then you're averaging out and mixing the prediction to come up with your final single prediction. And you, know, you can't really say one architecture is better than the other one. It really depends on the task you're trying to uh, perform and also the type of data you're dealing with. This is a pretty great table. Again, our authors um, uh, and their systematic review have provided of the you know, pros and cons of each um, type, which I'm not gonna go into the details of, but it's a pretty good table uh, to compare your architectures for your tasks. And quickly, I'm gonna touch on why would the authors choose pulmonary embolism? It, it, you know, it kind of makes sense. It's a pretty significant uh, medical condition, but most importantly, it's a medical condition that has a lot of morbidity and mortality. And that morbidity and mortality could be reduced um, if you could, you know, have a tool that um, uh, could kind of diagnose it for you faster. So you can, you know, reduce healthcare costs and also complications for patients. So I'm going to quickly go over the methods section. Um, there's a lot going on here. I'll do my best to be brief, but uh, kind of uh, understandable. Uh, so this infographic does a pretty great job of going through the data flow, uh, the workflow for data acquisition. So the... Um, uh, the study was set at the Stanford University Medical Center, and the inclusion criteria was NEP study that was done, I believe, from 2000 to 2016. Um, they used uh, a natural language processing or NLP tool to go through the radiology reports, and uh, based on those labels, they were uh, um, able to extract 2,500 studies with, uh, you know, almost equal number of positives and negatives. Um, then they got rid of all the crappy uh, imaging uh, studies with a lot of artifacts and poor quality, and that landed them at with 1,800 studies or so, and then two radiologists kind of went through the data, the imaging reports, and labeled them, and also labeled the parts of the CT that were positive for PE, so that basically sets up the ground truth in your data set, and then um, they went on to uh, create their single modality uh, models at first. So you have a separate uh, CT imaging only and one EMR only data, which I'm going to get to in a second. And then using those same single modality models, they created their fusion models, which I'm going to get into in a second. So first talking about the single modality models, and I do apologize if I'm going too fast, but there's quite a bit of data to cover here. Uh, but in a single modality uh, model, 
It was based on a, a model that you know, our authors had already published called PENET. Um, this model is basically a 77 layer 3D convolutional neural network. Uh, a bunch of uh, cool tidbits about this model, which I found pretty interesting, was that uh, first of all, it was pre-trained on the Kinetics 600 database. This database is a database of 600 different categories. It's a video database of 600 different categories of human interaction, like you know, shaking hands or hugging each other, which I found pretty interesting because you know, human interaction is not what you think of when you're thinking about diagnosing PE, but uh, pretty cool. Um, and also instead of having one CT slice at a time uh, input for the imaging, model, they had a stack or a window of 24 slices at the time, which I believe uh, improved performance. And they basically took this model, which they had um, developed before, and replaced the output layer with just a single output neuron, which would you know, then feed the uh, data further into uh, the model. For the EMR-only models, um, I believe most of them uh, were just feed-forward neural networks. And for one of the fusions, they uh, replaced it with an elastic net, which I'll get into. Uh, get to in a second. And as for inputs, they had uh, demographics data, vitals, meditation, uh, medications, both inpatient and outpatient, lab values, and ICD codes uh, from before uh, up to the, I guess, a month before the patient presented uh, with their PE study. This is an overview of the seven different types of diffusion models um, that they used in this study. Uh, again, I'm going to try to go quickly over them. So this was the one, the single early fusion uh, architecture they used. Um, again, these are the, uh, you see the features here in circle. Uh, these are your uh, machine learning models and that's your output here. So here uh, you have your PE net, uh, which again uh, gets the actual CT imaging, gives you the representation. And that representation is mixed with your EMR data and that is fed into your uh, fusion model here. The joint fusion models, they had two of them. Uh, one, again, you have these neural networks which are added, which uh, kind of uh, chew, uh, go through the data, come through the data, uh, come up with their learned representations. And that learned representation is then fed into a fusion model. And again, you get the loss function kind of uh, propagating backwards. And then the separate fusion uh, version of that, it just separated out the different types of EMR data. And each type is going into its own neural network. And they also had four types of late fusion. Um, the first type was basically like a, you know, your typical, uh, I guess, late fusion. You have your separate single modality models. They get their prediction. The predictions are averaged out. In this one, and the late elastic average, they swapped up the neural network for the EMR section and put in an elastic net, which is a, not a deep learning model. It's basically an old school um, uh, regression uh, function. And for the late separate, similar to that, but just separated all the EMR data to their own uh, neural networks. And at the late meta, uh, I believe they added a uh, meta classifier uh, to the neural network. Again, not going into the details, just kind of quick overview. All right, going over the results. So this is a representation of the data set they came up with. Uh, you can see the distribution of the data across the training, validation and test. Um, uh, data sets, and also you see the, the three different categories of PE, namely subsegmental, segmental, and central, um, and also some of the like demographics and um, other uh, data. Sure, we're going to move on from this. Is now the performance comparison. This table perform uh, 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 compares the performance of all the fusion models for timing. So you have the early fusion, you have the four different late fusion and you have the two joint fusions here. And again, these are different performance metrics here, but the one kind of we focus more on is the area under the ROC curve. And across all these models, the late elastic uh, average model performed the best, achieving a pretty impressive uh, AUC of 0 0.947, uh, which is pretty great. Again, uh, this was the model uh, that, that had swapped up the uh, neural network for the EMR side of the elastic net. And this uh, is a graph that, uh, you know, most of you might be familiar with. This is uh, an ROC curve. Um, and for those of um, our viewers who are newer to these terms, just quickly uh, going over this. So ROC curve basically is a tool that allows us to look at a performance of a binary classifier, a model or a function that classifies your data to you know, type A or type B, like positive PE or negative for a P. And basically any model or any graph that has the largest area under the curve, if you measure the area, 
is the one with the best performance. And here you see that the late elastic uh, average with the pink line here uh, clearly outperforms the other models. This is another view of the table. So in this one, uh, they basically grabbed the best performing fusion model and compared it to our uh, EMR only and imaging only models in two different settings. In one setting, they included all the subsegmental PEs, and in one setting, they excluded the subsegmentals. And why would they do that? Well, subsegmental PE in clinical practice most of the time is really ignored, so it's not clinically significant. You're really more mostly um, interested in central and segmental. So you can see that if you exclude a subsegmental, you actually increase the performance uh, from uh, 0.947 to 0.962, which is even more significant. And this was, I thought was pretty cool and interesting. So this is a graph representation of the predicted probabilities of the models. Well, I'll try to explain as best I can. So this is the imaging only, this is EMR only, and this is fusion. On the x-axis, you have the probability um, that the machine uh, is, or the model is giving you, the study being positive for PD. And the blue and the red, the blue represents um, uh, the negative studies, you know, the uh, ground truth negative, and the red represents the ground truth positive. So you can see in the single modality uh, models, there's a lot of overlap. So the model didn't really do a you know, perfect job of uh, separating, although the EMR does have some uh, pretty significant peaks here, but there is a lot of um, overlap here. So you can't really come up with a nice cutoff. However, on the fusion side, you see there's uh, this really beautiful uh, kind of separation, especially you know um, over here uh, of the two different types of data. And in fact, if you adjust the cutoff to 0.35 here, you get 100% sensitivity, which means uh, this model is able to detect 100% of all the uh, studies that are positive for P, which is pretty significant and amazing, actually. So quickly going over the discussion. Uh, so basically this study showed that the fusion model, specifically the late fusion model, late elastic fusion model was able to achieve state of the art um, AUC of 0.962 for the clinically uh, significant P studies, namely the central and the segmental ones. And it was a lot better than just a single modality model that we had. And also uh, if um, we adjusted a cutoff to 0.35, uh, we were able to achieve 100% sensitivity, which is pretty great with a you know, pretty respectable uh, positive predictive value of 0.83. And this means that this tool could you know, uh, be a pretty great screening, at least, um, tool for uh, looking at PE studies as they're coming in. And comparing it briefly to the previous models that were developed for detecting PE, this model is um, even more impressive because it avoids all the complex uh, feature engineering and pre-processing that normally you have to do to prepare your data for, you know, to, to put in a model. It kind of has an end-to-end -end, uh, solution. As far as limitations go, um, this was obviously, of course, a retrospective study, uh, which you know, has its own limitations. Uh, the data was only from a single institution um, and that was validated at single institution, institution at the time of at least publication. And uh, in the imaging side, they, instead of putting the CT studies uh, in directly, they use the feature uh, representation of that, which I'm not sure if it's so much of a limitation, uh, maybe a, a cool decision in my opinion. And lastly, in terms of the uh, decision and the conclusion that the late fusion model performs best, we have to keep in mind that we're talking about specific task of, uh, you know, uh, predicting PE using CT and EMR. So you can't make that general statement that it's the best, it depends on the task. All right, so that was uh, basically my overview, a quick overview of uh, the paper. Uh, now I'm going to open up the discussion um, to uh, the Q&A and our wonderful panelists. Let's see, I'm gonna see if I can have the QA come up. All right, let's see. All right, lovely. Okay, um, no questions yet, but do, uh, I guess I was so coherent and just everything made sense, but uh, I had some questions of my own. I just wanted to kind of um, ask first our panelists to fill in the gaps to try to kind of give an overview um, to kind of hopefully have people understand what's going on 
and you know the planning of the paper but i just wanted to kind of ask you know how like what was the thought process i know there were multiple papers around this project there was you know the gloria paper you know your peanut all that stuff but where do you think um you know this is headed because a multimodal fusion to me it sounds like it's another step towards achieving artificial general intelligence which we're you know pretty far from of course or, or to my knowledge but it seems to be the, the step in the right direction i just wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on that and how you kind of came up with the project All right, I'll take that one. Uh, so first of all, thank you. That was an awesome overview. And that is, that is not an easy thing to summarize, even if you had more than 20 minutes. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I and I know it, it tends to get in the weeds pretty quickly, but I think if you, I'll zoom out and I'll let Yvonne and Mars fill in some of the, 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 the rabbit holes that we could go down. But I think in general, when you think about what we're trying to do, um, if you sort of set as your North Star, your vision, is to try to mimic some of the, what we call the cognitive work of a radiologist, right? So if you really try to boil it down into a few tasks, obviously looking at the image in front of you, that is one of them, right? And we see a lot of folks that have spent time uh, building solutions that can address that, right? What is on the image? How big is it? What's the differential, right? Those kinds of things, right? Identifying it. But, you know, everyone knows that that's not what we're, you know, all of what we're doing, certainly, and, and maybe even not the majority of it. So if you think about, um, right, understanding clinical context, that's that's important, right? We understand that, I think, when we very first start our training, uh, that we kind of need to know what the situation is, right, to help narrow down or make the differential more useful uh, for, for the clinician or just for the patient. Uh, but then there's some other stuff, right? So there's um, there's the idea of, of comparing over time, right? And, and, and that's not something that, that has been tackled in this paper, but something that we've started to work on as well. So everyone will tell you, when you look at something and you discover it, no matter how much clinical context you may have generally, you still need to know, hey, has this changed over time? Or what, what did it look like before? Or even more challenging for us in the machine learning space, what did it look like on other modalities, right? So there's some other, there's some other things there that, um, that, that still need to be done, but that's a, that's a big part of our job, right? All of us that, that do this for a living, we, we recognize that understanding context and change over time are two other big components in addition to just looking at the image in front of you. And then, you know, the final one, which I would sort of say is if we're putting these things in four buckets, the fourth would be uh, treatment recommendation, right? So can you help guide based on, again, the image, the context, the change over time potentially or what it looked like in other uh, modalities and then finally what what should we do next like do we need to do imaging does this person need to go to surgery right those kinds of decisions and i think if we can start to chip away at each of those and that's kind of what uh you know i think our vision was for for a lot of the work that we're kind of building on then then i think we'll get closer to something that i think will be uh at least potentially more useful than the, than the kinds of things that we've we've started with. Clearly, we've we've made it a long uh, made a long way, uh, you know, toward toward just having these things in practice. Uh, but we still have a long way to go to sort of get to the place where um, we're starting to again mimic the the cognitive effort <laughs> that makes up the job that we do. Great answer, um, Iman or Mars. Go ahead, Mars, if you want to go first. Uh, no, I think Matt summed it up perfectly. I, I don't I don't pay you to say that anymore. You don't have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. You know, it's up to you. Apparently, Mars uh, was pretty content with Dr. Langren's response. <laughs> So I would say like one quick thing that we didn't really study on this particular paper, but there is a limitation here that we are actually dealing with um, a relatively smaller data set. If we want to go with like a really complex model with representational learning or something like that. So in that case, we are going dealing with a very small data set. So that's why I personally believe that our late fusion model, which was also kind of surprising to me and Mars both that it came out as like most effective model. But this is happening to this particular project due to that like size limitation. But I personally believe that if we are dealing with a larger data set, I don't know, maybe like 100K images with all their EHR, probably in that case, you can start seeing the joint fusion, like um, the middle layer fusion will probably be more 
uh, informative because then we we'll, we actually have to learn the correlation between the images and EHR together rather than building two separate model and then combining at the end. But of course, like that fusion always works best. We all know that it's kind of like um, very simple but useful technique. But yeah, so joint fusion and all this other fusion may also work depending on the data set size and the problem. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Like we have a very small data set and our EMR data is very sparse. So that leads us to choose uh, elastic net for our EMR data, which leads us to our best result. But we're confident that if we have more data, uh, deep learning usually can uh, come up with better representations from both of the modalities. Yeah. But that's not to say that late fusion is not a good approach. Right. There are cases that late fusion uh, would be the ideal choice. Uh, for instance, if you know that you're not going to have all of the different modalities present, then you can use late fusion based on your available modality. And that's a very, uh, that's a key point that you want to consider when you deploy multi-model fusion models in clinical settings. Yeah, I completely agree with Mars. And another quick thing, since Judy also asked us the same thing in the Q&A, that late fusion model actually also allow us to look at the interpretability part because you can look at like a fusion model is very difficult to explain that we all know, right? When we merge the medical image data and the text data together, it's always difficult to explain. But late fusion in that sense, like if, since it's a very simple model, we can actually like use it as onion, right? Like put like one layer at a time. So look at first the late fusion weights and see that which modality is like contributing uh, the more, relevance, right? Then go to that modality branch and look at their interpretability part. So basically we can do that in steps, right? But for like other kind of a fusion model is very difficult to explain. In that sense, the let fusion plays a good role for us here. Great, and to just, uh, I'm just gonna read out the question that he just answered. Uh, Dr. Gutroya was asking and kind of helping us moderate uh, that are the multi-model mo models more complex in terms of explainability versus computer vision versus natural language models? And I thought, so basically, you know, uh, you were all kind of summarizing some of the uh, pros of late fusion, which again, I, I was a bit surprised too. Uh, kind of, I was thinking that the joint uh, model would give the best performance, but you're saying that because, uh, you know, your examples were, you know, one of the modalities is sparse, you don't have a lot of, for example, MR data, or um, if you're trying to have an explainable model, these are more explainable. And also, I believe, you know, an example that late fusion would be best is if like your modalities are just two separate, like, you know, MRI data versus like mini mental state or you know, whatever that exam is. Uh, if I'm, if I'm uh, wrong, please correct me. But um, it seems to be that, you know, late fusion is a pretty powerful tool overall. Right. But the only, pro only problem with the late fusion is that you can probably understand, Sina, that during the learning of image representation, we don't really have a chance to look at the other feature representation, right? So imagine like a patient of age 80 years, when we are doing this kind of like image representation for the MR for that patient, versus like a patient of 50 years, we don't have that information separately until the model learns it from the image itself, right? But like the whole point of fusion is actually the, to supply that information separately, not that like we are forcing the model to learn it from images, right? But that kind of thing is missing in Let Fusion. But I agree with Mars that I, I personally believe that if we had the larger data set, joint fusion or this kind of like co-learning kind of like model will maybe much better. Yeah, and I, I, let me let me uh, also add a comment to that too. What's interesting is that I think when you, in retrospect, all these projects make perfect sense, especially when they tend to work. But if you think about where our headspace was when we started this whole thing, there was a decent chance that this wouldn't this wouldn't be better than than any single modality alone, right? So let me let me just tell you why. Because you know even if our EHR data was more rich, which it really isn't that. It, it, again, it's very sparse, and that's that's common, right? You have these punctuated you know uh, incidents of care, and you have a lot of data there, but then you got this time that passes, right? And then you have more data that comes in. And it's not very continuous. But you know we've seen, uh, in fact, uh, models where we early on we're trying to use just simple structured data to help the model. So for, you know, age being an example, Iman brought up, but, but in, in, in this particular case, it was a neuroimaging project, but there were already image features that told the model what the age, so it already knew the age, right? So it, it actually didn't help and, and in some cases made it uh, less helpful. So, and another thing that, that has come up too is where uh, we've, we've actually just tried to see what, 
other clinical features, the model can learn just from the pixels, right? And so you've seen some work that was done by David Oyang, who's a, who's a cardiologist and AI researcher now at uh, um, Cedar sinai and, and in some of his work, you know, he was able to show, for example, that cardiac echo uh, was able to even get lab, certain lab data, right? So, so it, it, is, it is not always assumed, I guess, just to put it back in perspective, that, that, that additional data, at least uh, of this kind, would be useful. What, one thing I want to point out, point out though, that, that this isn't just throwing the HR data in there. This is actually what, what Iman spent a lot of her time in Mars uh, on, on the HR side is actually doing a lot of feature engineering, right? So this is sort of like the equivalent of pre-processing. And, and by doing that, um, we were designing new features that would be, so, so for example, a change, an overall rate of change, right? These kinds of additional features were what we think, uh, what, what made the model actually perform better as a, as a quote unquote fusion, um, potentially rather than just the discrete data that points themselves. So just pointing that out. And again, like with all science, it all makes sense in retrospect, but as we were unfolding the story, it was quite, uh, it was quite sort of, you know, wind, it was a winding road uh, to the path here. And, and I think that, um, well, that's, what, that's what's fun too. But, but obviously there's a lot of discovery that goes on when you sort of try to embark on something like this and imagine where you want to be when you're done. Definitely. Um, Emma, did you want to say something? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly tell you that since Matt also mentioned that point that the feature engineering and the data building point, actually this feature engineering part was not only validated on Stanford, but we also validated it on Duke separately just to see that if it works, whatever like feature we created from EHI, it works at all. So we, we published a separate paper just with that feature engineering part with EHR. So we were confident that the feature engineering will give us a lot of like signal separately and will help us to improve the imaging model. And similarly for the uh, imaging yeah. model, we validated the results on the Intermountain Institute, right. um, but we just uh, weren't able to get multi-modality data from multiple institutions. Right. Yeah, that's what we're going to ask. I mean, it's a pretty high order to be able to get kind of you know, a lot of data from multiple institutions. That was my next question, that if you ever got to kind of validate uh, this kind of, multi, you know, the fusion model on different institutions like Emory or other places. So we are currently doing it. Mars can probably <laughs> tell you it. The work in progress. Work in progress, right? right? We are currently doing it on three other institutions. So, yeah, hopefully we'll have some results soon. And, and then just to point out too, like you can imagine now the difficulty we've had just to get all that organized, which is probably pretty common experience, right? With folks trying to collaborate across institutions, but then you add in the additional thing, well, then how do we translate a multimodal model, right? And if for any of you in the informatics space, that, that's an incredibly tall order, particularly if you're now saying, okay, not only are we gonna deploy this model, uh, but, but from the EHR side or whatever the other modality might be to assist in the imaging uh, diagnosis, how are you going to then automate the feature engineering, the data, and then have those data streams be coherent enough to be useful for a model like this? So we still have a long way to go. That really starts to boil down to infrastructure, which is a whole other discussion. But imagine that this, this shouldn't just end with, hey, this is a cool paper and was an awesome journal club. Like we, we do have this roadmap to see how is this actually going to impact practice? And of course, the individual models have opportunities to do that. But really, it's the innovation of how do we get a multimodal model in a modern healthcare system that's still maybe not quite ready uh, for, for data streams like this. Definitely a great point, I guess. It's, um, you know, having that, you know, especially with federated, uh, federated learning and trying to kind of have a model that performs well in different institutions. And of course, you know, we have very different infrastructures from uh, health system to health system. That'd be super, I'm sure complicated, but definitely, as you said, I think that's the, it just seems to me, it's the correct way forward to have these multimodal um, approaches. Although, as you said, it's not always guaranteed it's gonna perform better, but it just, to me, it makes more sense. Um, Dr. Gutra asked another question, um, trying to see. Uh, so it's a, uh, she asks, given what you know uh, from the long road, when do you decide to use the fusion model versus standalone models, especially with the amount of feature engineering required? Um, I would advocate for using multi-model models if you have the data. Uh, this is based on one of the review papers we've done. Uh, for all of those um, papers that have done both single modality models and multi-modality models, all of them show improvement in performance 
by leveraging <coughs> data from multiple modalities. So uh, if you have more multiple modalities, definitely try out Fusion. So I, I just I want to add like one comment that also Matt mentioned before that um, multimodality sounds so nice, but it's very complex in the sense that it's not only like modeling side complex, but it also complex in terms of data harmonization. And I personally believe that like data harmonization part is still kind of limited for AI model development. Okay, there are a lot of like, like standard exists that we can try, but still those standards are not widely adopted across multiple institutions. And specifically since AI is going towards that direction that we want generalization, we want robustness, but if we don't have kind of like data harmonization from the HR perspective, it's really difficult. So I think because of that, actually there are multiple techniques coming up that is like, just like skipping this structure HR and going with like clinic notes, which is like most easy to do the harmonization along with the images. But again, like it's a very complex journey. I think everybody has to like be on the same page with the data harmonizations so that we can utilize that rich EHR data along with the images. Yeah, and I think that the theme that you're gonna, I mean, I'm sure all of you who are listening and then, you know, those, those of you out there, you know, just watching this later, I guess, but uh, you know, this is a theme, right? Like all of us that either are doing the research, whether, whether you're interested in the research or you're interested in the practice or somewhere in between, uh, we, we are always surprised by, you know, hey, it's 2022, should be able to do X, Y, Z, and we're still not there in healthcare, and, and, it, and it is frustrating. Um, I think, again, just from the perspective of saying, okay, well, I know X, Y, Z should work, or here's a, here's a list of features that I just need to sort of set up for this implementation. It, it, it it's never ceases to amaze me how challenging that is. Uh, and we're talking potentially even years of effort um, so, you know, where we used to say some of the hardest parts of these projects are get, getting the data, curating it, um, and building the model is sort of a, a small percentage of that, right? Where we all kind of, that's the sexy part we enjoy doing. But then, then actually, then I would even argue that, you know, if 80% of that initial work is data wrangling, maybe even 80% of the overall project is getting the, you know, infrastructure ready for even deployment or, or good analysis, right? Understanding your, your actual utility, your outcome, your impact. This is still a very green field. So those of you who are looking for things to work on, I, I would say, you know, especially if you're not coming from a computer science background, or even if you are, this space of translation starts to really expand quickly. Um, you know, not only just from the infrastructure perspective, but then all the other things that go with it, right? How is it actually changing any sort of practice or patient outcomes? Um, are you presenting it in a way that could be biasing a clinician or the user? There's all these questions that start to come up as you as you start to double click on them. They just you know it, it continues to get bigger and bigger, and and that's what's fun, right? That's super exciting, particularly uh, if you're a young person coming up in this field. This is really where uh, you know again many many decades will be spent trying to really perfect how we can do this well. Definitely, and since you guys mentioned. Um, data harmonization. I just wanted to ask about what are the best practices with you know, data harmonization and now, especially since we see like the emergence of these in different data, you know, uh, repositories coming up, like how, what, what recommendations do you have from your experience so far? Nobody, <laughs> Nobody must touch the data harmonization. I mean, the, the irony is that we all, we've all worked together, right? Now we're all kind of in different places. We've all been at different institutions. Judy, Judy can appreciate this too. Uh, and, and we've been a part of these large national and potentially even international groups that are trying to sort of, you know, it's that same adage, right? You have three standards, you want to make it one, you end up with four standards. That literally is the, the, the kind of the cycle that we're starting to find ourselves in. I think things like fire, and OMOP, and, and the, those will start to settle out, my hope is, over time, but it is still incredibly challenging, even within an institution, but then uh, then try to sort of collaborating with other institutions, trying to figure out what is your data, <laughs> what is your data roadmap, what's your plan, what's your harmonization uh, strategy, right? Because it's, um, it, it is, it, to say it's not easy is, is really understating it. Yeah, I completely agree with Mars and Matt that it's it's impossible to put like a data harmonization policy on every institution in US or every institution in the world is impossible. I don't think that in near future we'll get to that point that every institution will agree upon one single scheme or one single protocol. But um, and it's not easy to do even the translation between one 
protocol to another or one schema to another. So I think we need to go with whatever we have it in hand. But uh, yeah, I think this kind of effort is really needed for future AI development. Definitely makes sense. And it's, you know, heartwarming to see, I guess, plugging the ACR AI lab and kind of, you know, um, efforts at the federated learning that's going on. Hopefully that will, uh, you know, allow us uh, or different healthcare systems to come up with one single, hopefully. So even if we just like forget about the EHR, even if we just focus on the DICOM, do you still consider that that's DICOM as standardized? Like, no, <laughs> forget. So Matt can tell you that we have to develop a model to identify what sequence it is because the metadata was like so messy like it's impossible like with that standard it's not standard you know so it's kind of like really funny yeah you just say oh hey you got dicom i've got dicom images we've got it all solved right no that <laughs> is, it is surprising one of the things i noticed too um you know, you know that you can sort of say hey just give me you know pull your cts of the head or whatever right so like that <laughs> seems straightforward but then you start to look at the protocol names and how they change, maybe depending on whatever the person that's in charge of the section or, you know, maybe the, the, the structured field from the software update change. I mean, there's just things like that, right? Sort of just trying to identify the right, you know, series. And that's, again, you know, bleeds over into implementation, right? So if my model is supposed to see axials at 1.5 or whatever, the slice thickness, like, just as Iman said, we we end up having to like have another machine learning network in the in, in sort of the pipeline just to get to a place where that can be optimized. Um, and you know, it's it it really is an interesting field to be sort of oh I I have all these assumptions going and that and that's kind of where um, it's important to kind of stay irrationally optimistic <laughs> and and sort of you know define your your north star and then just you know do what it takes to to sort of make your way there, but. You know, these are the things that can really bog you down and then trying to find how do I pull some meaning or value out of whatever workaround I've come up with uh, that can give back to the community. I think ACR is a great example of at, at least an attempt to say, here's the framework, here's the vision for how this should go, right? So we have a, a way to look at that and say, okay, well, I see AI evaluation, I see federated learning, I see harmonization of data across, across institutions. Okay, that's an awesome vision. Now we have to execute and I think things like this, right, just trying to raise awareness, um, even, even if you're not into machine learning, this is going to potentially play a significant role in your career. And so um, finding a, a place where you, you know, uh, enjoy working and, and maybe can get some traction, that nor sort of North Star or map that the ACR provides is really just a great framework to say, okay, which of these things do I feel like I, I want to get involved in? Definitely. Hopefully, uh, you know, people listening will take note and kind of bring it up with every, uh, you know, um, basically person they can from the institution. So hopefully we can involve everybody involved and all the stakeholders so we can come up with a unified solution. Um, I just wanted to quickly kind of go back to the model training because I thought it was pretty interesting to me. Um, the the PE net. Um, you, you guys trained it with Kinetic 600. Um, and that might be a typical thing people do, but it was kind of new to me. I just want to kind of uh, touch base on that and how um, you think training a model on a completely separate different task or data set actually uh, translated to like improved performance um, in detecting PEs. Yeah, and I mean, this is not very uncommon even for a lot of medical imaging uh, models. We've seen people use uh, ImageNet pre-trained models and uh, do transfer learning for medical imaging tests. Um, we're essentially doing the same thing, except this time we have 3D inputs, so we need to use a 3D uh, data set for pre-training. And uh, we can draw the comparison between CT scans and videos, since CT scans are just a series of 2D slices, and a video is just a, a time series of uh, 2D frames. So if you look at it this way, um, we're both training on 3D image as pre, for pre-training, and we want to do fine-tuning on a specific med medical imaging task. Yeah. And in fact, currently we're working on a, a new paper that tried to prove that this type of uh, video pre-training can work on multiple uh, 3D medical imaging tasks too, not just for PE. So you mean just in a CT world or also like different modalities like ultrasound or MRI? 
Uh, right now, we're only looking for CT, but uh, potentially we'll expand it to MRI and uh, echocardiograms too. That's pretty awesome. Actually, looking forward to that too. And one other question I forgot to answer, which was asked a bit earlier on, was what's the difference between the fusion model architecture and the graph networks? Kind of going all over the place here a little bit, but yeah, I can answer. I can answer that. That um, for the graph, actually, that we are currently exploring a lot for creating this kind of like EHR and imaging kind of fusion. But for graph, we have a different motivation compared to future fusion model because graph we want to explore the patient similarity. So we are not really using the EHR data for really the learning purpose, but more to learn how similar these two patients are. And we know that if we can capture the similarity in the model somehow, this will help us to learn a better representation of the data. So imagine like if you, as I was telling you the example before, so imagine that a patient has a prior stroke and then the patient has the PCTP images, right? If we want to capture that information, there is one way that we do it now, like as a fusion, that we have a separate model or like combining the EHR data together, or we can just draw a line or edge between that two patients and one to create a graph, it's connected graph, just to see if the model can learn the similarity or weight or learn the weighting of the similarity of between these two patients, because it's not like the stroke, what kind of procedure was performed on this patient, what the patient's prior social habits are, like what are the drinking habits, like what is the patient age, right? So all these, given this kind of like, all these similarity criteria, can we ask the model to learn a better embedding based on the similarity itself? So it's a slightly different approach than direct fusion, but yeah, some it works. So we published like multiple paper, on this graph-based fusion model, and Judy was um, author too. So yeah, mm, that's kind of interesting. I think that was a nice plugin. Um, wonderful. Um, and um, one other thing I wanted to ask. Oh, I wanted to ask. I forgot to bring this up. Um, I was just you know kind of looking around uh, around your work, and I came across a rad fusion data set, and kind of it's you know in, in the realm that we we're discussing. So just wanted to see if you guys could kind of comment on the rad fusion and where you are with that and what are the thought there. Uh, sure, so the Red Fusion data set is just a public release of the data set that we've used uh, for this PE multi-model study. Uh, we want to encourage more people to do multi-model fusion. So we released uh, both the imaging and patient EMR for people to experiment with uh, the newest and latest type of multi-model fusion, yeah. So it includes, I haven't looked too deeply into it, but it, it includes all different, the architectures that you guys used, or is it like a, like a roadmap and how they could kind of make their own? Yeah, so it, it has all of the data we use to train all the different type of models. And we also have a, um, a GitHub repository with all the models. So once you download the data, it should be pretty easy to plug in our uh, current framework and train these multi-model fusion models. Yeah, it's been really important. I think this just speaks to the broader uh, sort of idea that, you know, we, we, we generally have a common belief, I think, amongst our collaborators and our team, uh, for the most part, to say, you know, medical data, uh, if we believe it that in large quantities can actually drive it innovation that will help patients, then we tend to believe that it's a public good under that definition. So in other words, if we can de-identify it responsibly, it shouldn't be owned by anybody or locked down by anybody because by doing so, particularly if it's certain segments of the population that already don't uh, get to be included in these kinds of you know models at the development stage, I I feel like it, it does a disservice to the field, but certainly to to the end goal, right, which is patient care. And I so you know once the what we like to say is once the primary purpose for the healthcare data has been achieved, so your diagnosis has been made, your you know, your, your care has been, you know, completed or whatever the, you know, reason for you to have medical data is. at that point, um, it's just sitting somewhere. Um, maybe it's on, you know, part of some other, you know, project or whatever, but just in general, though, the, the data itself still has a lot of value in aggregate for things like this. And so, uh, you know, I, granted that Stanford is not the largest healthcare system in the world or the most diverse population in the world, we are trying to just continue to, to lead by releasing data. Um, NIH has done a fantastic job. There's actually, you may have seen, um, this is for everyone too, to, to, to know about, you know, the NIH has started to 
put some teeth behind their mission towards making data and potentially even models and code available for NIH funded projects. So there's, you know, almost 300,000 NIH funded researchers, right? And so that means that all the data that they use for their projects or the things that they've done under NIH funding, uh, starting in January, they'll, they'll at least need to have a, a mechanism to make that data available to others. And not just kind of the, oh, the data is available if you ask us, but, but literally have a plan for it. And I think that that's what's been missing, I think, in our field. Uh, reproducibility is certainly a crisis, right? Um, and we see the innovation, sometimes we chase it, even if the data uh, isn't available, and then we find that, that we can't reproduce the methods, et cetera. So it is an opportunity, I think, both to help the field broadly, but then also uh, have a little bit more integrity in our scientific processes as we, as we do this kind of work. I think that's fantastic. I think it's great that you guys are kind of setting um, you know, uh, an example for people to share their, you know, the data sets, their, their models, and, you know, you're not being too stingy uh, with, uh, with the, your process. And I think hopefully that will allow people who don't have access to those models or data sets, uh, kind of test, test out their thoughts and processes. And hopefully we'll get, you know, pretty good development um, into, you know, the future of healthcare when it comes to machine learning. Uh, well, I would love uh, to thank our wonderful panelists for an amazing discussion tonight. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us to discuss this paper and also your insights on the project. Uh, I learned a lot. I'm really excited about where you guys are gonna go with the small time model fusion. I'll be looking out for those and also how other institutions hopefully will implement um, you know, similar projects. Any, uh, I guess, uh, final remarks from our panelists? Yeah, I, I think Sina, you did a great, great job summarizing the paper. Thank you for it. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Of course, uh, of course. Thank you so much again. Um, again, for our um, participants, the video of this recording will be available uh, through the RFS website. Um, and for just reference, these are the kind of the papers we discussed, the main paper, and also the papers surrounding it. If you're interested, you can go back and check them out. Uh, do tune in and look out on Twitter for our future uh, sessions, and please do join. And again, thank you guys so much for tuning in, and um, we'll hopefully see you later. <laughs> right, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.